it's not a cycle. It's a cycle which you cannot see, but which we assume that there has to be circulation of patents between those institutions, and how efficient is that being organized in a system. So in order to make your debt more, perhaps more understandable, and uh, hopefully, let me try to explain that once more in, in this visualization. You see, uh, I'll try it once more. Here you have the idea that the tree can have an overlap, but they can also have, they don't have to be organized centrally. Yeah? So you don't need a real center of the system. This is a decentralized system and it corresponds to what we call a pluriform society. Government is one of the players, but it is not like in the old times in Moscow, the central player. It's still perhaps in Beijing a bit of the case, but they are loosening it up. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, so it, it doesn't need, it, it can be that there can be circulation among the three without any center in the system. If there is of course, as, you, as it is instantiated, as it is realized in real life, yeah, things have to be integrated. Yeah? So for, if, for example, we take such an apparatus like a microphone or such an apparatus, electricity and the materials, everything has to be shaped and integrated. Yeah? That's an instantiation, it's a local integration. And that local integration can go along trajectories. So tomorrow this apparatus will perhaps be different from today, yeah? So it goes along, it has a history, like this machine, at a certain moment it will stop to function. But at the same time, we generate that global integration, and that relates to the, the discussion yesterday about how knowledge is there available, that how is that system of knowledge base, is that functioning, can we say something about that? And I think we are very fortunate to have a triple helix indicator for that. So the triple helix is a, gener is a synergy, synergy generated. Is there a dynamic effect of the formation of an overlay? And we can call it also a model of self-organization. Yeah. So here you have, let's say, organization, yeah? new institutional relations, yeah? which have to, can be organized. We, we know that we can organize them differently and that it's, it sometimes it helps to reorganize, sometimes it doesn't help. Yeah, but, uh, usually people evaluate it with hindsight as helpful, but it, we don't, uh, we, we, we have to question that. And, we, and this level is in a certain sense self-organizing and that makes our society so modern. Yeah, that it is, that we have we have institutionalized that in the in the civic society in the civic liberties. Yet yeah, we have the freedom of academic research, the freedom of the market, the freedom to have elections. Yeah, that these systems are separate freedoms which we have institutionalized in our societies since the French and the American revolutions. Somewhere, yeah, yeah. 18th century has created that. Yeah, and then later it became in other countries uh, available. So we have this liberal, pluriform society which self-organizes its own knowledge base and it can do that in different formats and it can do it at different levels. It can do it at the national level, at the regional level, at the, at the international level, at the global level or perhaps the European Union. Yeah, so you can, or even at the city level, so you may be a very wealthy innovation system yeah uh, so you can but that's organization yeah so we we always have to organize it it's two sides of the same coin yeah it has to, it needs to be organized and it needs to be left free to self-organize and we have to evaluate in uh, it has to be it is self-organized yeah sure Thing. <laughs> we understand that there is industry, we understand that there is university, 
But how does it come that things can circulate among this thing? And that we and that from that, so I use the same cause in order to explain it's metaphorical in a certain sense. Yeah? To help understand how it can happen. And then I hope that this helps, but if it doesn't help, then please forget about it. <laughs> okay, thank you for your question. Okay, so we know that uh, that from the institutional perspective, we know that, for example, you can have uh, maturation effects, yeah? That's the historical dimension. And but the question is, then, how does this play a role? I, I mentioned that because of this, because I wanted to show you this picture. This is the Beidou effect. It's a typical intervention of the American, uh, probably people are aware in the 1980, I think, two American senators, Bay and Dole, proposed a new law, uh, the Bay Dole legislation, which means that the university can keep some of the money which they earn with patenting. Yeah. And, and everybody thought that then, then they will start doing that. Yeah. Actually, they did for a while. Yeah. And then they stopped again. <laughs> because it's not their main mission. Yeah. As most of us are aware, our main mission is not patenting, our main mission is publishing. Yeah. So, and patenting takes a lot of time, and at a certain moment, people become aware that it is a waste of that time because they don't get any money from it. They may they lose money, they may even lose money. Boston University lost a lot of money on patenting. So, and, and so they stopped uh, doing it, except for the University of Tokyo. The University of Tokyo is still patenting like hell. Yeah. <laughs> That's national policy, so for the, the Japanese. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure about Seoul, but uh, we should check. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, I, I just want to show you that that the institutional dynamics, everybody is talking about. So you, you get this typical S shape, yeah? Uh, and then it, at a certain moment, you, you, you see that the saturation steps in, and so that the institutional model comes to that. I think we are very fortunate, and I've worked on that, uh, as the Hamel already explained. My first publication on that was in 2003, actually, when I showed my pictures, these type of pictures, to Bob Ulanovic in a meeting in somewhere in Canada, in Toronto, he said, we have a measure for that. And, and then I began to work on that. He's from biology. And he, he used that measure. And he said, nobody is using it. Please try it. And it worked like it worked beautifully. And Hans showed beautiful pictures about that, and beautiful data. Also, for the, the, he even showed the data from 2000 to, for the different world regions. And you can see, yeah, you probably are not aware. I, I, I wrote down the formula for, for one of them yesterday as a probability distribution. What is the idea? If you have a chance that can be yes or no, yeah, then you have two options. And the beauty of that formula, let me write it once more down, H is sigma with a minus sign B log B I, and this is 2 log, yeah? I don't know if you write it like that. Some people write it differently. possibilities they're both 0 0.5 yeah if you work that out you get a one and that means that if you have two possibilities which are equally possible yeah then you get one bit of information so that's the beauty of that definition and then you can go on because you can do it for for three possibilities and for four possibilities and for an enormous number of possibilities you can do it for many dimensions you can do it for Two dimensions, you can do it for three dimensions and dimensions. You can do it over time, yeah, then the formula changes a bit, yeah. And, and Shannon has done that all in 1948, and we call it the mathematical theory of communication. And, and one of the consequences of that mathematical formula, this is then a very simple one. It follows that the transmission between 
the two uncertainties, I and J, is the sum of the two minus what they have in common. Yeah. So it's like this. You can probably draw it like this. So you have to sum them, but then you have twice this part. So one part, at one time you have to subtract them. Okay. Yeah. If you do that for three, you can show that you get this formula, and Han already showed it. Uh, and it depends on how it precisely works, how the configuration is, whether this leads to a plus or a minus sign. It's the same story as yesterday. Okay. And, 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 and then we have this beautiful data, uh, particularly in the... Uh, so I'll begin with a repetition a bit of what Helm did, uh, but then I'll show you for other data. We have, in the science studies, we have this beautiful data for science citation index where we can just pinpoint whether something is a university address or an industry address. That's a lot of work, and there's someone in Korea doing that work. <laughs> I think here in Seoul, he may be in the audience. Yeah, no, he isn't. He is in data. He is in data. Yeah. Right. And uh, and the same is done in uh, in some systems. We have that type of information. We have it in Canada. I asked everywhere in the world. Actually, the first time I asked it uh, in in the world was when someone Yuan Sun from Japan, she's Chinese by background, came to a meeting in Belgium, and she showed that data. And they had worked for years on it. I said. Oh, but well, fantastic. Shall we co-author? <laughs> I know from 100 you have to co-author. <laughs> Shall we co-author? You have to be precisely the, the right type of data. She had even more beautiful data, uh, and in a moment I will show that. And actually, it brought me to this, and, and Han already said it, to this program, and I'll show you just for fun, and we have plenty of time. Do we? Try to. Yes? Yeah. Oh, my God. That's why I want my own computer. <laughs> How do I get from it? Say open. Do it from here. Then it will work. You want this, this mean?
okay, if it would have worked, <laughs> and, and you can, can try it yourself in your home computer, yeah?